So right now there isn't a lot to do outside because many of us are in our homes. So let's learn about Titanic's hospital and medical staff, shall we? And what would happen to Titanic if an outbreak of an infectious disease started to overwhelm the ship? First, we need to get an understanding of the contagions and outbreaks that could threaten an ocean liner. Quick history lesson of the pandemics that both affected and were aided by the shipping industry. Cholera. All the pandemics that affected the shipping industry have had several waves. Cholera has had many and killed millions. It became widespread in the 19th century, and passenger and immigrant ships saw outbreaks aboard forcing the United States and New York to impose tougher quarantine requirements, including having an inspector board ship if necessary. Bubonic Plague Famous throughout most of history, but one wave from 1855 was considered still active until 1960. While largely constrained to the continent of Asia, it was transported to Europe and the Americas by ocean-going trade on infected persons, cargo harboring fleas, and of course rats. Yellow Fever A mysterious tropical illness was given the slang term Yellow Jack, infecting entire ships, and when caught by this illness, the crew hoisted a yellow flag signaling their need for quarantine. To this day, when a vessel is put in quarantine, they raise the yellow jack. Influenzas. One from 1889 to 1895 around Russia, which was spread by modern transport, especially transatlantic travel. And the second, during World War I, while after Titanic, was no more aggressive than previous strands, was aided by malnourishment, overcrowded conditions, and poor hygiene, which boosted superinfection. Due to the war, censors downplayed death tolls to keep up morale on both sides. However, newspapers were free to report the epidemic's effects in neutral Spain, creating a false impression the country was hit hard, giving rise to the nickname Spanish Flu. So with all these pandemics and deaths, the governments from countries in Europe and North America, two of the spots for mass immigration at the turn of the century, enacted laws to identify any immigrants who might be ill and prevent the spread of illness before it could infect a ship. Let's say you're an immigrant, and you've just purchased your ticket and you've finished traveling miles by foot, rail, horse, donkey, carriage, and you've arrived at Southampton Docks. You can't immediately board Titanic. First, you're required to go through an inspection queue. You've answered around 30 to 40 questions, and you're going to see two doctors. They hand you an inspection card, which will be filled out after your examination. The steamship lines were held accountable for those medical examinations before departing port, so they employed the doctors, but the examinations were usually too rapid to figure out anything besides the most obvious. Disinfection and vaccination was performed, and if you showed any signs of quarantinable diseases, you weren't allowed to board. If your general appearance was okay, and if you weren't a quote, idiot, and when any minor defects such as a lost eye or finger or low stature were properly marked on your cards, you were finally on your way. Those filled out inspection forms and similar crew muster sheets were the responsibility of the ship's medical staff. Titanic had two surgeons aboard as part of her crew. Okay, let's clear something up right away. For my American brethren, surgeon does not mean what it means to us Yanks. As far as I'm aware, as it meant in 1912, it still means the same today in the lands under British rule. Surgeon just means doctor. They weren't performing organ transplants or operations aboard Titanic, which is what a surgeon does in the United States. Okay, moving on. Dr. William O'Laughlin was at sea for 40 years, was born in Ireland, and studied at Trinity College and the Royal College of Surgeons, both in Dublin. Before Titanic, he was aboard her sister ship Olympic. He apparently had some apprehensions about sailing on Titanic, however, according to a colleague, but it seems Captain Smith talked him out of it. He dined often with Thomas Andrews, his friend, in the dining saloon, and while the ship was sinking, he was witnessed standing quietly with the pursers and shaking hands goodbye at the end. The dock's assistant surgeon, John Simpson, was born in Belfast, along with the Titanic, and obtained his medical degree at Queen's University. After he too left Olympic, he discovered his luggage was broken into aboard Titanic and someone had stolen six dollars from him. During the ship's evacuation, he gave 5th Officer Lowe an electric torch, flashlight, saying, here is something that will be useful to you. Their duties aboard ship were to make sure passengers were cared to if any of them reported any discomfort as they both had hours posted, and to look for any potential risk to general health, especially outbreaks of contagious disease. They needed to quickly identify those and make sure they were confined. The doctors would make inspection tours of each passenger class, fill out proper forms and daily reports, and inform the captain. Upon arrival at New York, they would hand over their reports to the officials coming aboard for quarantine to make sure nothing was risk. They had some help, too. There was a hospital attendant, William Dunford. His body was found wearing a steward's jacket, and hospital attendant was sewn on the arm. Catherine Wallace was the matron in third class. 
While not medically trained, she would still take care of families and single third-class ladies. She was one of the three female crew members not to be saved that night. On a lighter and more exciting note, Australian stewardess Evelyn Marsden was a qualified nurse. Apparently she loved horses and the ocean. She sailed aboard Olympic and was actually on her when she was in the collision with the Hawk. She reportedly was right next to the collision zone. And during World War I, she was actually back home in Australia. Shout out to some of the passenger doctors sailing aboard Titanic. Dr. Henry Fruwin to Dr. Henry Frothen Oh Frothen and no Dr. Henry, Chief Surgeon of the Hospital for Deformities and Joint Diseases in New York. He helped Mrs. Harris when she fell down the actually we'll get to that later. Canadian Dr. Alfred Payne. One of the foremost surgeons in Wisconsin, William Minahan. Dr. Ernest Morawieck patented several surgical instruments, including a new style for ocular forceps, but he happened to also be a con artist. Allegedly. Dr. Alice Leder studied in Philadelphia and Paris and was practicing medicine in New York. Dr. Arthur Brew was a member of the AMA and the National Geographical Society. He traveled to Egypt with Margaret Brown. Dr. Henry Washington Dodge studied at the University of California and later became a member of the medical department's faculty with the title of Professor of Therapeutics. Now it's time to learn about the hospitals and their layouts aboard Titanic. There were a couple of ways on Titanic to get medical assistance depending on your class. If you were crew, there was a hospital forward under the forecastle with two berths and a surgery. Surgery again is not a room for operations, it is a room where a doctor would come and examine you. This area was explored in the wreck by James Cameron. A similar surgery was aft for third class by their entrance on D-deck, complete with a waiting room in case there was an influx of patients. So you might assume that first and second class had access to the surgery on C-deck and the hospital on D-deck. Well guess what? That's wrong. First class and second would have the luxury of a doctor's visit directly to their cabin. A concept which is completely alien to most of us born from the 80s and onwards is that the doctor would actually go to your house when you're sick or you fell down the stairs like a fool and broke something. The same happened aboard Titanic. When Irene Harris fell down the grand staircase on April 14th, the doctor came to her cabin to check on her. And when she wasn't satisfied with the diagnosis, she went and saw Dr. Fratinello. Whilst Ella White was boarding the ship, she fell on the gangplank and twisted her ankle. She had Dr. O'Loughlin come to her cabin and see her several times. And then there was poor Hugo Ross. He was brought on board Titanic on a stretcher as he was fighting dysentery. The doctor certainly would have made several visits to him as well. Perhaps he was feeling a bit better, but by the morning of the 15th, he was reported saying that it would take more than an iceberg to get him off the ship, and he went back to bed. So if first and second class passengers were seen and cared for in their cabins, what was this big hospital for on D-Deck? It had several rooms with lots of space, ventilation, and plenty of beds, facilities for bathing and washing, toilets, three toilets, and even an infectious disease ward, which was separate and ventilated its air up into the fourth funnel away from everybody else. There was even a little space reserved for a padded room, classic in many insane asylums. But what was this all for if second and first weren't seen in any of these rooms? It was used for third class. Third class passengers would not be taken care of in their cabins, which were often shared with sometimes three or up to nine other passengers, but in the hospital, where there was plenty of space, exam rooms, and facilities which allowed them to properly recover. On the redesigned Britannic, the hospital was moved to be in the all third class area under the poop deck. On Aquitania, it was also way back in the stern in the third class areas. It was a standard to provide third class better conditions if they were sick than their cabins for recovery. Oh, in that padded room? It was sometimes used as the ship's brig. Honorable mention has to be made quickly for Britannic, which had her life as an entire hospital. She was a giant floating nursery full of wards, exam rooms, and had morgues in the back of the ship. This was part of wartime measures. Olympic later had a mortuary added down near the mail hold, as sometimes death happened on voyages, and while burial at sea was common, it was less normal as ocean voyage was done for pleasure and not immigration. So what if a contagious disease somehow was missed by the inspection queue at Southampton or Queenstown, and it began to spread throughout steerage as she sailed towards New York? Obviously, let's pretend this is something that might happen to a Titanic that didn't sink, or Olympic, perhaps. 
For our hypothetical disease Titanic, we can study a real life event for two ships. The steamers England and Virginia, 46 years earlier. They left Liverpool, bound for New York, about the same time, end of March and early April. The first few days were normal for the 1,150 passengers and crew aboard Virginia, until a steerage passenger suddenly got sick on April 12th and later died. The ship's surgeon found diarrhea spreading everywhere in steerage. Death started to mount, and the news spread like fire throughout the ship. Even though the passengers were divided up by steel compartments, it spread to both men and women. As Virginia made her way to New York, dispatches were sent reporting on the crisis. Cholera is increasing on the steamship Virginia at a fearful rate. 33 new cases have occurred. The hospital, at quarantine, are capable of holding only 75 persons and at 67 are now aboard. En route, England encountered rough seas and then cholera struck. A priest aboard wrote in a letter, on the fourth day after our departure, a German boy was found dead by the side of his mother. The body was consigned to the deep. When he was dead, he was black. It was cholera. Everything was done to cheer up the other passengers, but to no purpose. Still death continued. Eight, 10, and even 15 died in one day. And the same number of times a day I was seen standing at the gunnel, performing the last service and sliding the bodies into the deep amidst the screams of the passengers. The bodies of those who died aboard piled up and were buried at sea, much like the bodies of some of Titanic's victims when they were found by the overwhelmed crew of the Mackie Bennett. England arrived at Halifax for quarantine, where 214 would die. Virginia arrived in New York with already 37 dead. The priest from England, learning Virginia had no priest aboard, made his way to give those suffering last rites. Eventually, the passengers were removed and put into a quarantine hospital, and it is believed that due to these swift actions, that the deaths from this cholera outbreak were only at 600. Modest compared to the many others. Given how intense the flu was due to the close quarters men were in during World War I, the cramped quarters of Steerich on Titanic could have been disastrous for any terrible illness. This what-if scenario for Titanic is why she is always so interesting and relevant. We had situations unfolding a few weeks ago that could have, in theory, been unfolding on Titanic in her day. So what do you think if a large ocean liner, not a cruise ship, back in the teens or 20s of 1900, was forced into quarantine? Would it have helped prevent the spread of the virus? There are many possibilities and perhaps the discussion will keep us busy as we're stuck in our homes for the unforeseen while. Thanks for watching everyone. For Titanic University, I'm Matthew Dwinkler, and please stay safe out there.